Thank you for joining us here at Legacy Church Online. Our prayer is that you were inspired by the message and that you were encouraged today. If you'd like to help continue to give financially, you can do so on the website, or many others have even dropped it off here at the church. We appreciate your generosity. We appreciate everything that you're doing. We would lo also love for you to connect with us. Connect with us on Facebook. Connect with us on Instagram. Go to our website. Send us an email. However you can get connected with us, we want to stay connected with you. We love you. We thank you. And we cannot wait to meet with you in person again. God bless. Good morning, Legacy Church. Let's stand and let's worship him this morning.
of glory now the Savior knelt to wash our feet now at his feet we bow the one who wore our sin and shame now robed in sing it your name your name your name is victory come on lift them up church all praise will rise to Christ our King your name your name is victory all praise will rise to Christ our
resurrect a purpose even when life looks like it looks like it's in ashes so, so go with that this morning before we even get started that that's free I only got I only got to goal number one goal number one was make it up the steps without tripping take the microphone and make sure that it's on so I think I'm probably done <laughs> you can be seated this morning Oh gosh, so it's been a while since I've done this. I think I've been here for almost 16 years, uh, and it's been about six, I think, since I, I brought the word. The last time I was up here, Cam, come here real quick. The last time I was up here, I was taller than he was, and that's a day that's long past now. I love you, son. But... Um, this is my home. Legacy Church is my home, and uh, it's absolutely an honor to be able to stand and and uh, and bring the word of God. It's it's by His grace that I was that I'm able to do it, and uh, I hope my hope today is that uh, your hearts are softened and you hear this message because I believe it's absolutely what God wanted me to bring, and uh, absolutely what He has for you this Palm Sunday. So let's pray real quick because I don't want to go any further without him all over the message. So, Father, I just ask that you would bless the word this morning. I pray that you would be with me the, the entire time. Use me as a conduit, Lord. Not The, the word's not mine. It, it's yours. And, and I'm just here to deliver the way you've asked me to. And I pray that you would allow me to do that in, in your grace and, and be honorable to you, Lord, and that it'd be a blessing to those who hear it. And, and it'd be light to our feet. You know, it'd be a light in our path. And you would just bring us through and show your love through this uh, this word this morning, Lord. And we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's my intent this morning, we're, we're starting a series uh, called Son of Man, which uh, honestly, I, I love how God works because when, uh, when I was texting uh, Brother Daniel McMillan, uh, he said, he, he gave me the, 
the theme, Son of Man. I said, okay, well, we're talking about Jesus. That should be easy. Um, no problem. I can get up there and talk about Jesus. I, I've been in church for 16 years. Jesus should be, no, not so fast. Uh, Son of Man, it, it unpacks. I had to call, I got the text on uh, a week, a little over a week ago Sunday, and then the next day I was on the phone with my dad. And, hey, Dad, can we, uh, can we start looking through the Bible together, a.k.a. like, I, I, I need help. Um, and, and I need someone to, to bounce these things off of. So uh, this is a team effort. Every time I'm up here, my daughters listen to me uh, read and preach at nothing for the last couple of days, right, at her. And she's uh, so, you know, nicely just let me do it and not, not made me feel weird about it at all. Um, but even when you look in the Bible, um, when, you, when you open up and do a quick study uh, just the simple phrase, Son of Man, it reveals so much more than what someone might think from the surface. It's not just, this is Jesus, you know. It's, uh, for me, it was that point where I said, okay, now the challenge is accepted. i got to figure this thing out, and uh, game on. Lord, you show me what I need to see. And, and when you look in the Old Testament, uh, the Son of Man is used roughly 107 times. Um, especially in the book of Ezekiel, where the term is used 93 times. And almost every time it was, described, it was used to describe man or human or mankind. But the title of the message this morning goes hand in hand with, it, it just doesn't, it's not quite what it seems from first take. Uh, the title this morning I had is, Jesus Changed Everything. And... Um, We'll look more closely, closely this morning at the, the term or the title, Son of Man, and see that Jesus did certainly change everything when it comes to this, this meaning of the Son of Man. Uh, the main scripture this morning, if you want to turn there or pull up your Bible, I, I, however you find your scriptures, go ahead and do that. Uh, it's Daniel 7, and I'm going to pick up in verse 13. Um, Prior to verse 13, Daniel is in a, a pretty wild vision of what we would consider the end times, where there's principalities and powers that are ruling over the nations that are evil, and, and there's a vision of them running crazy, and, and God finally taking authority over, over this moment. He, it, it is the, the climax, the peak of human history where God's rule and reign now comes full circle and he's going to do away with evil and move towards God's eternal kingdom. And in verse 13, Daniel says, as my vision continued that night, I saw someone like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient one or God and was led into his presence. He was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. Like we said, like I had said, Daniel chapter 7 is just this, this wild vision. If you read the description, it's, it's almost surreal what, what he's talking about. And how, do you, how does your mind grasp it? But what I really wanted to, to focus in on is there's this point... Throughout the whole Old Testament, Son of Man is referring to just a man, and or mankind, or the father of so, or the the son of somebody's father. It's not, it's not specific. It's not uh, special, I guess you could say in any way. It's just a term. And, but verse thirteen, the Son of Man clearly becomes more than just a human being. Uh, this reference to someone like the Son of God, He came. He, it was different. He came on clouds of heaven. That's not, that's not something any of us can do. I don't get to jump on a cloud and show up where I want to go. That'd be fun, but not, not me. Um, he was brought directly into the presence of God himself, and we know in the Old Testament that was, that was not happening with just any man. Nobody was brought into God's presence. There was a high priest, and he was the only one once a year to be able to do that. But this person, this person like a son of man, was led into the presence of God himself. And this person was given all authority 
and an eternal reign. The Son of Man at this point is no longer just merely a human. This person is heavenly, divine, and worthy to stand in the presence of God the Father. So, at this point in the scriptures, we have a change. It now becomes a twofold meaning. And so, the first point this morning is Jesus, Jesus was fully human. By all stretches of the imagination, he was fully human in every sense of the word. Similar to how it was used throughout the whole Old Testament, the Son of Man points directly at his humanity. The meaning doesn't change. It speaks to the fact that Jesus was completely human, and it is Jesus' humanity that allows him to empathize with us. He can feel everything we feel. He can understand when we hurt. He knows what it's like to be tired. He knows what it's like to be tempted and betrayed and even experience death. Everything you could ever experience in life, he's experienced because of his humanity. This is what the the writer in Hebrews was referring to when he said, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all the all who have lived their lives as slaves to fear of dying and then even again in hebrews 4 15 he says for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet without sin or yet he did not sin because jesus was the son of man it makes it impossible for him to identify with you and i that's an amazing thing when when we feel alone, when we feel like there's no one else around, he understands. He gets it. He can, he, he, he's taken that form. And, and it's amazing because in the beginning with Adam, he was simply a man. God created. It was, he was a man. And through Adam, sin entered the world. But... Uh, you know, and this was due to his disobedience to God. But in turn, it would require human obedience to bring justification for the sins of the world. It could only be done by a human vessel. And Jesus, who bore that temporary body and became a son of man, he, he was able to do that. He had to put on humanity in order to get us to salvation. In fact, the Son of Man also occurs, it's funny, like I said, you, you look up one term and you can get lost for hours. Um, the Son of Man also occurs in the Gospels. Um, in Matthew, it's 32 times. Mark, it was 15 times. And Luke, it was 26 different times. And in those first three Gospels, the title is always recorded as have being used by Christ himself. It didn't come from the lips of another man. Um, uh, never by an angel or by a demon. It was Jesus, Jesus' title of choice for himself, even more so than the title of Son of God. He described himself as a Son of Man. It's Christ's own description of himself, and it's a term that links him to humanity and shows his intimate and positive relationship with the human race. I think of the scriptures a lot where Jesus... Uh, Jesus was going through the temptations where the Lord seen standing at the level of humanity. If we see Jesus at a human moment in time, it's when he's being tempted uh, by the devil. And, and he was in the wilderness being tempted as a man, clearly a representative of the human race. And, you know, the first, the first temptation, his response was, it is written, man shall not but live by bread alone. Jesus is really, in effect, saying, I'm in this wilderness on a human level as the son of man, taking the place of every other human being. He was representative even then of just the humans. I, he, he would say, you know, he's saying, I obey the law. Uh, you know, that's the standard by which every human should live by. He was relating to us, bringing himself to that level, there was nothing that said he had to. But he knew 
what his mission was, and he was willing to take on that humanity. Even through the second and third temptations, he referenced scripture and put himself within the limitations of a human life. He didn't need to do that. He didn't have to do He chose to take the limitations of a human body and, and live like we do. And he declared through those temptations he was living according to the law, which he was changing in that time. His lifetime was changing. The covenant was shifting the law into what we have today. Um, Jesus sat and declared at those times that the law which governed him is exactly the same law which governed everybody else. The term son of man entirely indicates his relationship to men and, and women, obviously, and proves that he's, he's in kinship. He's, a, he's right next to us with the human race, his complete identification with the human experience. But as we saw in, in Daniel 7, that's only half of it now. Something changed. The term means something different. So if we look back at, at Daniel 7, point number two is that Christ or Jesus was fully divine. The prophecy in Daniel encompasses a long look at future, the future history, you know, a look into the future, the end times. And we all get kind of, uh, I don't know, we, we all get enticed by those things, but we, and we want all the answers, but there's some clear things that happen through there. It, and it's a realization of the time when the enemies of God are brought to final judgment and the people of God share in its rule. And what appears to be at the peak of history, right at that point, one like a son of man approaches the ancient of days to receive universal authority and eternal dominion. He's like a son of man, yet the scripture does not say he comes from earth. How are, from earth to heaven, but out of a, obscurity. He, there was, he wasn't there. He wasn't present in the court. It, he came from, he came in riding on the clouds out of, a, uh, out of obscurity into manifestation, approaching the throne of God as though he had right. There was no hesitance. There was no lack of confidence to approach the throne. He, he was there. He rode in on the clouds of heaven, which that in, in itself, if you look back through Psalms and other things, is a, a God function. Riding in on the clouds is is God's work. He's a son of man. Someone looked like human, but riding in from nowhere, seemingly out of out of nowhere on the clouds, to to go before to go before God. He's worshipped during that time, and it and so that at that point, it goes to indicate that this one, like a son of man, is absolutely divine in nature. He is. He's the Messiah in those scriptures. Uh, Colossians 1.15 starts off by saying, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Fully divine, fully human, and fully divine. Jesus in the gospel, in the gospels, would continue to take on that mantle, that title of, of son of man. And even in, in Matthew twenty eight eighteen twenty, he says, or eighteen through twenty, if I can do it right, if I can speak appropriately. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's, it's incredible. It's a beautiful dual meaning to the, title of, to the title of Son of Man, describing both human and divine nature of Christ. And I love the fact that Jesus is really purposeful in his use of the term. To those who had ears to hear, Son of Man would have directed them to the Scriptures in Daniel. Those who understood what Jesus was saying would have said, he's talking about that vision. They had those scriptures already then. To the Pharisees, to those who wanted to convict him, the Son of Man was a simple statement of being a human being. So he could use it interchangeably in public and not be convicted of a crime, yet be referencing. So it's a purposeful title. It's his choice title, but he held... He, he used it with, with knife-like precision. It's incredible how he, how he used it, brought this dual meaning to life, and encompassed it. I, I just, I've always been, uh, he, it's always struck me as fantastic how when we do Bible studies, uh, on Wednesday nights, gosh, those were fun. I, where's Brother Don uh, at? I love those Wednesday night Bible studies. But we would always say, Jesus is like a magician. There are hundreds around waiting to get him. And he just slides out or he purposefully uses the right terms. He navigates through everything without being caught. It was, it's always been one of those things where I'm like, how did he slip out of that one without being pinned down, but he used terms that left little doubt to the believers of who he was and left enough room for those who were trying to convict him not to be able to do it. But both that divine and human nature leads me to the third point this morning, is that Jesus was the only one who could stand in our place. After Adam's original sin, mankind was in desperate need for all that time for a Messiah to come. They looked for it for years. Palm Sunday is described as a triumphant entry. The triumphant entry on a colt. Nobody expected that. It's very human for him to ride in on a colt. It doesn't, wasn't fantastic. It wasn't a giant war horse. He didn't come in with an army, but it's a triumphant entry into Jerusalem on this Sunday. He, he changed everything for all of humanity. First Peter, 20, or, or First Peter 2, 21 through 25 says, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned, nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we could be dead to sin and live for what is right. His wound, by his wounds you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Can I just say when I'm insulted... I don't always let it go. I, I just don't always let it go. Says he, when he was insulted, he didn't, he didn't seek revenge. He didn't threaten revenge. When he was persecuted, he didn't retaliate. He never lied. He never deceived anybody. Good luck for all of us. I mean, he's the standard, but let's be real. These things are hard to do. When you've been done wrong, how do you not turn back around and fight? When is it time to silence it and live past it, live through it, move forward? In order for Jesus to redeem us, he had to become like us. So he struggled with that. He didn't retaliate when he probably felt like it. You know, 
The simple truth is that Jesus could not be our substitute if he didn't take on human flesh. The Bible states that without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Jesus had to take on the identity of the Son of Man because without it, he could not shed his blood. And without that, there could be no way to redeem us. He had to bear the full weight of our sin, which would not have been possible without him taking human form. But within that human form, there was clearly divine presence. The authority of God that healed the sick, raised the dead, and saved the human race. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God to humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. And in my last scripture this morning, Romans 5.17 says, For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it, it will, it will live in triumph over sin, death, or sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. As I close this morning, it's a beautiful reminder on this Palm Sunday where Jesus made that triumphant entry into Jerusalem, began Holy Week. You know, that one man, this son of man, Jesus, is the bridge between the Father and all of humanity. There are so many titles that have been given to Jesus in the Bible, and each one of them reveals another aspect of his character and helps us better understand who he is. This title of man's no different than the others. The fact is he took his divinity, wrapped it in humanity, and became the son of man. To sum it up best, he became like us so we could become like him. God's kingdom will come into its fullness. And it will come by the saving work of the Son of Man. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, for this time, for this moment. Thank you for Jesus, Lord. Thank you that he changed everything. He steps in when, we have, when we're full of doubt, when we're full of uncertainty, when we're not sure where we're going to go or what we're going to do. He steps in. He's our mediator. He's our counselor. He is the Son of Man, and He's your Son, and he, He's there for us when we need Him most. He's there when we can't get past ourselves to see Him. Lord, I pray that the, if there's any here this morning that are in question of that, they would just take a step of faith, Lord, to, to reach out, to reach out and ask. Reach out and, and see, taste and see that the Lord's good. Father, I thank you for everybody here. I thank you for this opportunity. Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Oh, Thank you, thank you.